know, watching that reminds me of the journey that I have taken to get me here, a woman in a male-dominated world, which has been a lot of fun, by the way. Um, today I'd like to address four things, how I got here, what it's been like, what I've learned, and what I can pass on to you that might apply to your own life. But I'd like to get a sense of the audience. How many of you are sports fans? Die-hard sports fans. Married to a die-hard sports fan. A waffle and a spaghetti? OK. Um, well, ironically, I did not grow up a sports fan. I went to some Padres games as a kid. I played Bobby Sox softball. Uh, we watched some football and baseball maybe once in a while on TV at home. In fact, um, growing up and in college and in my early my career, my boyfriends who like to watch sports, I just tolerated sports. Um, it was not part of my world until sports opened up my eyes and my world to something which was so new and so exciting. But to get there, let's go back to the beginning briefly. Um, as you heard, grew up in a Navy family. My dad was in three wars. My mom was a teacher. She is almost 88. She was here running the iPad for me this morning, so glad you're here, Mom. They raised the four children to uh, get an education by seeing the world on a shoestring budget. And since, since the second grade, I was encouraged by my mom to write about my adventures and my experiences. Uh, in the eighth grade, I was watching the news with my dad, and I said, wow, there's a guy standing in front of a pyramid, holding a microphone, traveling the world, telling stories, and getting paid for it. That's what I'm going to do. Now, what helped me as I was going to pursue my career, which television would have been hard enough, were two sayings. One, my mom said, where there's a will, there's a way. And one, my father made up, don't wait, anticipate. I eventually paid my dues in the TV world. Uh, in Texas and Oklahoma. But then in 1991, I, uh, against the advice of most people in the business that I talked to, I quit my job, moved home to San Diego to help my family take care of my father, who was diagnosed with and eventually died from ALS, Lou, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. So I, uh, I had taken a pay cut and was working almost an entry-level job at NBC when I got a phone call from my friend and former mentor, Dennis Morgino, who had been in the business and TV in San Diego for a long time. And he said, there's an opportunity to create a channel for the Republican National Convention, nonpartisan, um, just telling the San Diego story. I said, great, I'm in. What we didn't know is four months later, when my contract was up, the Padres and Cox came together to create Channel 4 Padres, and uh, they asked me to help come on board to create that. And I said, um, I don't know, you know, sports? I mean, I'm not a sports fan. I don't know much about that. But I didn't let that scare me. I didn't let that basically disqualify myself from being in this whole new world, um, something that I really knew very much a little about. But I knew about storytelling. And so I was determined to apply what I knew to this new world of which I knew very little. Now keep in mind, this was the late 90s. And sports reporting was still fairly new for women, you know, both nationally and locally. In fact, um, for those of you who may or may not have been watching television back then, for three years I was the only woman in San Diego covering sports. And uh, I was the, a rookie. <laughs> so that, what does that say about, um, you know, what, they had a lot of confidence in me, I guess. But I, I wondered, you know, how I was going to succeed in this new world. How I would, the lone woman and a sports rookie, mesh in this mix of testosterone, tradition, and intensity. Because we know it can be an intense world. Would I be accepted was one question I asked. Not really scared, but wondered. And I know that several conscious decisions I made 
set the tone and set the standard for me and for how I would try to make that happen. So I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted to be that connector between the players and the fans. That was really our mission. I also knew what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be one of the boys. And I wasn't ever going to be the girl who unbuttoned her blouse or dressed provocatively to get the interview or to get attention. I had far much too, too much respect for women in broadcasting and women in sports, which there weren't too many of, but there were some pioneering women back then. I had too much respect for what they had done to fall into that trap of what could have been easy, especially for someone who didn't know much about sports. And so with a lot of enthusiasm and willingness to adapt, I took control. And it was a delicate balance. As we were hustling to create and launch uh, Channel 4, one of my first assignments was to do a feature on the very attractive, with the piercing blue eyes, and that, those marquee good looks, that third baseman who everyone was enthralled with, Ken Caminetti, whose name I learned to pronounce when I was told I was going to be interviewing him. Um, he had just, anybody remember Ken Caminetti? There we go, we got some sports fans, good. Well, if you recall, he had just won the National League MVP. And the um, big question, though, because he had sh shoulder surgery, is would he be ready for opening day? So before I flew to Houston with a photographer and a small crew, I was warned by people who knew him quite well. You know, Jane, he's a quiet guy. Good luck. Not going to talk much. And don't talk to him about some of those sensitive issues, some of those things from his past that you know, his drinking and some other things that he might not want to talk about. I said, okay, thank you very much. I'll take it from here. So fast forward now to Houston. We're at his home where his wife, Nancy, and their three girls, she just had her third baby when we were there that week or just the week before. We sat up in the living room with just one camera and a couple of lights. He wore a blue and white plaid shirt and jeans sat on a couch. I wore, wore a very conservative navy blue jacket, high cut white t-shirt and khakis and sat on a chair. I had done my research, but um, you know, I'd never interviewed a, a major league player before. I wasn't enamored. I wasn't really nervous, actually. <laughs> um, I felt confident that my nine years of reporting and some of the things I had done uh, had prepared me. So as I write in a book, take, take yourself back now to, to that living room. And if you remember that show, um, you, you can visualize a little bit. But I started from the beginning of his life. And as we went along, I could tell he had so much inside him. It wasn't that he didn't like to talk. It just seemed as if he needed time to think and express himself. The rush of the typical pre- and post-game interviews was not necessarily his comfort zone, and that might have been why people didn't think he liked to talk or had much to say. But given time and with some patience, I discovered he would open up. One specific topic came up about the relationship with his parents, and that opened the door to talking about his rebellious times as a teenager, challenging times in the early part of his career and his faith. And while referencing his special year of 1996, our dialogue went like this. I said, do you have a sense of why this was your year, Ken? I don't know. I accepted the MVP award a couple nights ago, and part of my speech was God gifted me this year, and he really looked after me. Well, tell me about your relationship with God. Well, it's been a rocky one. Because for me, in 87 and 88, I asked him into my heart, Jesus Christ, but I didn't do it for all the right reasons. So while my questions were simple, his answers revealed so much. If he had not brought up the subjects I had been warned not to broach, would I have brought them up anyhow? Well, probably. How could I cheat him, his story, or the fans of something that was so personal but significant? I'll never know. 
But I do know that I followed not only his lead, but my intuition in delving both into obvious and sensitive topics. Now, I don't share this to claim that I inspired this quiet man to open up. I tell this because in this new venture, I learned that it was okay to follow my instincts and to be myself. No matter how much I prepared, just listening and caring showed him respect and hopefully a genuine concern and made him feel comfortable enough to express himself. And in the bigger picture, it was the unexpected prelude for what was to come. And at the time, getting to know players on a personal level was not the norm, and certainly not through interviews in their homes, and certainly not with a woman interviewer. So as I was charting the course of the content and my style, I relied on my navigation system, my GPS, my girl positioning system, or as I call it, my gut positioning system. And in this particular realm of athletes and sports reporters, mostly men, they are largely consumed with knowing stats and rules and history and pitch counts and critical innings and jargon and jokes that, you know, I could have easily really felt like an outsider or not been taken seriously had I been caught not knowing something I should know. So I did my homework. I listened a lot, and I had the gumption to act when I was confused or clueless. And I was okay with not being that sports expert, but informed about what I needed to know, and obviously absorbing and experiencing a lot of sports, of course, over time. And I do wonder, had I pretended to know something in this new world where I was so new, if I had pretended to know something that I didn't know, uh, would have I been embarrassed or considered a phony if I had pretended? So I decided it was so important to use these tools of honesty, curiosity, and a willingness to learn to navigate this new road. You know, they all knew a lot, but I knew a little too. Now, I just, I'm sure you, know, you realize this is a man's world, and as you might expect, it was not always pretty. We've seen those shots after games in the locker room. Not always a, a nice sight. But the choices I made were a matter of judgment. And if it was going to have my signature on it, which included setting the tone for much of what we produced at Channel 4 early on, it was going to be real but tasteful. So when we started editing one-on-one -on -one and all the other features, I made an editorial decision. I staked my ground, and I said, anything that ends up on the air, if I have control over it, there will be no chewing tobacco, no spitting, no scratching, <laughs> always a lovely visual, and no swearing. Granted, you can't really swear on TV, but you know what I mean. You know, those elements might have been part of the game, but I did not want to glorify or focus on them. And you do have to be wondering, well, did you go in the locker room, Jane? Come on now. Uh, yeah, my major league credentials gave me access like they would to any reporter. But call me crazy. I had no desire to mill around the half-dressed players before or after the game. And most of the time, I didn't need to. But there really there's a reason for that. My philosophy was I considered where I would be interviewing them, the kind of rapport and trust I would need to develop, and who would be watching. The interviews would be in their homes, and I didn't want to be sitting in their living rooms next to possibly their wives and having them wonder if I had seen their husbands in their underwear or less. Now, there have been times during postseason when I had to go in, and that's just part of it, and now that I'm a little older and they're a little younger, it's not as big a deal. But at the time, I really chose not to be in their tory, territory just because I could. And a year into Channel 4, a woman close to the team told me she had heard from players. They appreciated how I wasn't in the clubhouse with a microphone or hanging around the lockers chit-chatting and that they respected me for respecting their space. Her comments made me feel good. One, because someone was actually paying attention, 
And two, it showed me that I was building a professional reputation with the players as well as the front office. And my experience was very different than others I've heard about who had to deal with some cruder side, some of the cruder side of, of being around male athletes and in the locker room. And I just have to say, I feel very fortunate that that was really almost never part of my experience, both in baseball and football when I covered the Chargers as well. So earning respect and earning your place. And while I can be tough in certain situations, and I'm fiercely determined and a perfectionist, coming in, into this and, and coming at these players as a tough woman wasn't going to get me anywhere. And it certainly wasn't going to get me where I wanted to go. So did it make a difference, especially in the early stages of my one-on-one -on -one venture, that I was a woman? Well, here's something for you to consider. In a 1997 Union Tribune newspaper article called Courting the Women, Don Johnson, the Padres Vice President of Marketing at the time, said, quote, she asks questions that I would have never thought of. I don't think that way. She's asking about the kids, the family, and the important things in life that, quite frankly, guys just don't talk about. So did part of my approach make a difference in how I succeeded in a male-dominated world? Well, I think so because I didn't do the norm. Of course, good thing these guys actually wanted to answer my questions, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here talking to you about this. But I didn't play it safe either. You know, I took risks. I asked questions that, about difficult times in their lives. But in all of that and how I approached it, I operated off my own moral and professional compass, mostly showing, I believe, respect and consideration. And what I discovered with the interviews and shoots with the athletes was that even the tough, strong male athletes could have fears, concerns, a lack of confidence, damaged egos, hang-ups, heartaches, and big, soft, generous hearts. And given the opportunity and the right situation, they were willing to share. They were willing to let me tell their story and pull back those layers, go beyond the box score, to the heart of the matter, to their character, warts and all. And we know nobody's perfect. But this was a different approach to getting to know these athletes, these people that our kids looked up to, the good and the bad. It was important to show them how hard these guys had to work to get where they were. I also discovered that while people might have thought we were just approaching and trying to get the woman um, audience, that at least anecdotally, in 15 plus years, I found that men and women equally have been interested in these stories. Back in the summer of 97, Padres manager Bruce Bochy, we all remember and love Bruce, heard that I planned to interview the team president at the time, Larry Lucchino. And for my book, Bruce later told me what Larry told, uh, what he told Larry. He said, Larry, you're going to learn things about yourself that you didn't even know about yourself. So I guess I did know a few things. A woman in a man's world? Yep, and grateful for it. So how can you apply many of the things I've learned into your own experiences now or in the future? How many of you right now are working in what you feel to be a male-dominated atmosphere? Not a lot, but enough. <laughs> and if not today, maybe tomorrow. Okay, so here, let me sum up some of these things that I think you can apply. I hear and I say, be true to yourself. But I encourage you to explore what that means. What is your true self? What are your values? Who do you want to emulate? And what are you willing to change? Because I've learned, and also by watching others at times, that if you're going down a path uh, of professional, potential professional destruction, falling into traps, being one of the boys, doing something that maybe you're really not comfortable with, uh, it's okay to tweak yourself. 
it's okay to say, I'm going to redirect. Make deliberate choices about what you're comfortable with and what you aren't, about what's going to help you get where you want to go without losing yourself along the way. And as for being a woman in a male-dominated world or industry, I think it's okay to acknowledge the differences. Embrace them, capitalize them, not by using your feminine wiles, that old-fashioned term, but by applying your strengths and what makes you you. And if that means a softer touch, a less intimidating tone, a calm or an enthusiasm that are magnetic without being distracting, then go for it. It means find your GPS. And what might be a highly testosterone-charged atmosphere or tradition, find your way through that. Be strong enough to chart your own course. I think really when it comes down to it, I have a, another little saying. I don't know if I came up with it or I read it somewhere, but we are our TWA, our thoughts, words, and actions. So be authentic. Be transparent. I really believe that transcends gender and will get you where you want to go. So thank you for your time. I hope you'll join me out in the lobby. I have some books with me. I'm online at janemitchell1on1.com. And I'm really fascinated to be part of the conversation and to share my experiences. Thank you for being here.